our Tech Insider update for February 2022. Um, appreciate everybody who's attending. Um, those this, who've attended this many times, welcome. And, and those who are new, um, we're glad you're, you're here with us. Um, for those who are new to this uh, webinar, we do this quarterly um, to give an update on all the new and important things that you should know when, when using Microsoft technologies. Uh, my name is Mark Mickelson. I'm the VP of Client Solutions, and I'll be kind of uh, emceeing the, the webinar today. Um, to get started, just a, a few important things to know about. Um, first of all, the, there, we will be at any time you need to ask any questions, um, please do so in the chat, and we'll be responding to those there. Um, if we have time at the end, any unanswered questions, we'll go ahead and, and um, at the, ask those and get some answers immediately. But if we don't have time at the end, and if there are any unanswered questions, we'll reach out to you to make sure you guys uh, get the answers that you're looking for. Um, also, um, importantly, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and then at the end of this event, uh, or end of this webinar, we are going to have a survey for everyone to fill out. That survey will be shared. That link will be shared in the chat. So please be sure to, to fill that out. And for doing that, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive a gift card. And then also, um, maybe even more importantly, um, filling that out will qualify you to receive a copy of the slide deck after the, after the webinar is over. So for those of you who are new to Journey Team, I'm going to go through and just do a really brief introduction of us. Um, so we've been around for 29 years, um, and uh, our company has grown quite a bit over those 29 years. We're now, you know, 130 plus members. In fact, I think as this next week, I think we might even be hitting 140. Um, a lot of good competencies, really happy customers, um, doing a lot of good work. We've uh, been a two-time part of the year win winner with Microsoft, um, won many um, in, uh, best places to work awards, and are also part of Microsoft's inner circle, which means that we're we're one of the one of just a handful of partners who get to talk and communicate with Microsoft early on about things they're going to release, changes they're going to make, et cetera, and, and are able to give feedback to them. Now, as our organization, um, the majority of those employees I mentioned were our, our specialists. Um, we have very different categories that we specialize in. And this slide here gives a shows a bit of what we cover and what we do. Um, we work on ERP systems or accounting systems. We've got a team dedicated to customer relationship management, teams for cloud, content and collaboration, data and BI, and we also uh, focus a lot around change management and adoption. Um, in addition to just from a technology standpoint, our specialists know and understand the business outcomes that you're looking for, and that's really key um, to help make sure that you're moving, driving forward the things that are important to you and, and what you're trying to accomplish as an organization. So today, presenters, um, I've already introduced myself. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Kip Sorensen, our SharePoint director, Brandon Gordon, our Dynamic 365 customer engagement director, Jesse Olson, our enterprise, one of our enterprise resource planning consultants, Jamie Few, a cloud and Microsoft 365 team lead, and then Nathan Gillian, who is uh, a business intelligence uh, developer. So our agenda is going to go as follows. We're going to start off with some updates around Microsoft Teams and Yammer. SharePoint Forms and Viva, OneDrive, then we'll move on to Power BI and Power Apps. We'll hit touch on some important things with Cloud, Azure, and Office 365, Azure AD Exchange Online and Intune. And then uh, we'll finish out with Dynamics 365 Business Central and Dynamics 365 Customer Engagement, Sales, Power Apps, and Marketing. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to uh, Kip Sorensen, who will get us kicked off with Teams. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark. So we have a lot of updates on the Microsoft Teams front. My apologies for a lot of these bullets, but I'll speak to these briefly, provide an update. All of the updates that I'm sharing should be released into your tenant and or will be in the very near future. I'm not talking Microsoft's near future as is six months or 12 months or whatever. I'm talking this month or next month. So let's go over first Microsoft Teams and the updates around meetings themselves. So we're getting the functionality around raising of hands. Before we had that, but you had no idea who raised their hand first, second, or third. So we're actually, we're, we're gonna get notification in the chat or the participants bar showing the order by which people have raised their hands. Around meeting recording, we can actually have speed uh, playbacks at a higher uh, speed. Transcripts, those recordings are now being indexed. 
And then we can also set up auto recording and auto expiration of recorded meetings. This is handy for a lot of organizations that we've auto recorded a bunch of things and now it's kind of getting unwieldy uh, in regards to how much recordings we have. There's integrations now available for Operator Connect conferencing tools. Um, I don't have the specifics of what vendors, but the capability of uh, working with an operating conferencing uh, solution is now available to us. And the most important update, everyone get your pins out. You can unmute yourself using your keyboard shortcut using control space. That can we just end the webinar now, right? I, I think that's the most profound thing. Actually, I think it's handy, so I use it all the time. All right, custom backgrounds are coming to the web. Uh, music mode, so Teams' ability to actually recognize that music is being played and it auto-adjusting for high fidelity. You can switch the mirror of your webcam in your view to be mirrored versus not mirrored. And then when we set up webinars like this webinar today, we can now have a somewhat vanity URL at teams.registration.yourdomain or your Microsoft365domain.com. And then the co-organizer meeting role is now also available. There is, and now the co-organizer does not have the exact functionality as the organizer, but there's a lot of shared features that are now, now available. All right. Now, uh, other updates around Teams. So around calling, um, I mentioned this already, but obviously the Operator Connect conferencing, Walkie Talkie for iOS is available. If you haven't played with Walkie Talkie for Android, it's kind of fun. Uh, Teams phone has some updates around 911. Transcripts for one-on-one -on -one, uh, phone calls is now available, as well as some uh, updates around VoIP and call history. Then if we go into Teams chat and collaboration, uh, the ability for us to provide alt text around images that we actually share within the Teams environment. Before we had the ability to pin chats, but it was like a chat. And then once you pinned, it will replace the other one. Now you can pin multiple chats, not just on a one-on-one -on -one chat perspective, but also posts within an actual given team. Then updates to SharePoint folders are now being reflected within the Microsoft Teams interface. So when you're on the files tab and you end up renaming um, a document library or you rename a subfolder, it will actually be reflected within the Teams uh, breadcrumb document library names. So kind of handy for those that, of us that have renamed the standard documents library to like Teams chat or something else. Okay. And then a quick update on the application integrations, the approvals or approval app within Teams. If you haven't looked into it, look it, look into it. It's actually part of your Teams subscription and you can actually manage all the Power Automate approvals that have come to you. That now allows you to actually uh, assign approvals to a 365 group and not just an individual now. So the pretty, pretty awesome update from Microsoft Teams there. Okay, moving on, uh, devices. There's a bunch here. So hot desking on Teams displays. So this is not for all Teams devices, right? So you have to like do your own little research here. Um, but the main thing is Teams devices are now rolling out with Cortana, uh, Cortana integrations. The hot desking, aka like a dropping into a conference room and just meeting right away. Split video layouts are now coming to Teams devices. So then that way you can have multiple displays in the room, one for presenting and the other one for uh, the participants. And then switching between those multiple video cameras. And then a new layout is rolling out called Front Row. It's in preview and that will be coming to Microsoft Teams rooms as well. Okay. All right, we're almost through Teams. And then security and compliance, the key things here, those that have service hubs, that's now a managed device in the Teams Admin Center. Um, there's updates to the Teams Admin Center, a bunch of adjustments. I mentioned this kind of already, Teams recordings, automatic expiration is now part of there, as well as configurations around global notifications within Teams, which was a major request from a lot of our clients uh, now we can actually configure some of the global notifications across the board for your entire tenant. And that is all. Uh, oh, government, we have to play nice to the GCC cloud. So you guys are finally getting breakout rooms, um, custom backgrounds on the web, 
And then since the TV label support in the team's admin center is coming to GTC tenants. Okay. All right, let's do some Yammer updates. Just a few minor ones, nothing too serious here. So there's updates to the profile page. Um, creators have the ability to edit topics in line um, as well as uh, expiration auto renewal for Microsoft 365 groups and then reminder emails around staying connected to your communities. Uh, and then even some suggested communities and people to follow is being integrated within the, tank, uh, the, the Yammer interface. So that's it on Yammer. Forms, pretty quick update here as well. In fact, only one update really. And the update is you now can put your forms into collections. It's just a way for us to organize your multiple forms into unique classifications. It doesn't really come up the other additional functionality other than that. All right, Microsoft Viva. If you don't know what Microsoft Viva is, ping us and we can do some demos, whether it's insights, learnings, topics, or uh, connections. But the few updates that you should be aware of, there's an official licensing suite for Microsoft Viva, where you can actually have a SKU and get all of Microsoft Viva in a, in a, in a single license SKU, where before you'd have to buy topics and learning separate. So Microsoft now has that available. On the insights front, uh, team leads now have the ability to schedule team focus time. So I can grab my entire team and schedule focus time. So we all have focus time at the same time. And then also on insights is we're keeping a history of the praise functionality. So before it was just kind of, it would throw into chats and there wasn't a history. That history is now being available to you. And for those that have been diving into Microsoft Viva topics, we can now, there's a built-in uh, search capability to find additional files and pages to make references on your topic pages. Pretty slick tool where before we had to be very specific about the files that you're including within your Viva topics. All right, SharePoint updates. Really broke those down into two categories. The first is around content services. And this isn't really SharePoint, I'm, I'm cheating. So the Microsoft homepage, if you go to portal.office.com, there's updates there. Now the content is coming from SharePoint, so I stole it as my update. So there's changes to the portal homepage. You'll see here that you have my content. You can see recently opened items, items that are shared with you, browse by location, as well as different uh, areas. So this is kind of a cool update provided by Microsoft. Microsoft is also rolling in the spell checker and grammar into SharePoint pages. So then that way you're getting that content and then SharePoint pages are now rolling out with section templates. So if there's a consistency of a footer or an element on a page, you can save that as a template and utilize that template across multiple SharePoint pages. Around SharePoint collaboration, we now have taxonomy columns in SharePoint libraries and lists in the modern view. Uh, we can edit captions and transcripts for videos within SharePoint and OneDrive. Teams navigation, you can switch from a horizontal top nav to a vertical. That's a capability. List is going to show up in your SharePoint app bar on the left-hand side. Whether you think that's a good idea or not, we can debate. I think it's a bad idea. Moving on, board views within SharePoint lists. That's going to be a slick interface. And now you might ask yourselves, why use list boards versus planner? Well, that's a good question. So Microsoft providing you more options to do the same thing. And OneDrive and SharePoint document libraries. Uh, this is pretty slick. So this is a drop down menu. And when you go to a SharePoint document library, you're going to get a drop down to the right of the document library, and you can easily navigate to other libraries within the site. Now, one would argue that this is a great idea, unless, of course, there's a library that you don't want to promote. It's not going to get promoted in that drop down. So uh, it'll be an interesting update to see how this gets adopted. And then syntax uh, is getting site templates, flow templates, and model templates, which is actually a, a major update for Microsoft. And I'm almost done. Two OneDrive updates here, and we'll move on. So if you have not used or looked into cloud shortcuts, it's actually a really neat interface. This is available also within Teams, but the idea is you can have the Teams file tab and create a folder in there that actually points to other cloud solutions. That's called a cloud shortcut. We now have the ability to move those cloud shortcuts. Now, the question that I already know everyone's gonna ask is, 
when you move that cloud shortcut, it's going to change permissions of the cloud or of the source. And the answer is no, it's not going to change any permission set. It will just move the shortcut around. And then OneDrive is also rolling out some sync health reports on the admin side so we can help manage some of those sync issues that we experience within uh, the tenant. There you go. I'll take a breath and now it's someone else's turn. Great. Thanks, Kip. Uh, this has been a really exciting quarter for Power BI, so let's get right into it. <clears throat> Here are just some high level updates. Uh, you can see that we've had a Power BI REST API update that allows admins in Power BI to manage subscriptions to reports and other assets inside of the Power BI service. Uh, deployment pipelines can now do even more. Uh, direct query now supports Power BI data sets and Azure analysis services. And there are hybrid tables, which are now in preview. More on that later. Mm -hmm. New visualizations are also available, which include sparklines, scorecards. We've got a new formatting pane and a really exciting feature, quick create functionality in Power Apps and Dynamics 365 is in preview. So let's dive a little more into deployment pipelines. So deployment pipelines have been around for a little while. You've been able to have a dev test and production workspace where you could move reports and data sets in between pretty easily. Data flows, however, weren't able to be moved between those workspaces yet. Data flows now can be moved between all the different workspaces in a deployment pipeline, and that includes data flows that are in a series. So one data flow that links to another data flow that links to another data flow. You can move all those data flows in between pipelines. Now remember, deployment pipelines are premium only, but if you need to manage, you know, do ALM application lifecycle management for your Power BI, this is a great option. And now it's even more functional. Moving on to the quick create in Power Apps and Dynamics 365, you can enable this uh, <clears throat> with the uh, in the Power Apps Maker portal. Um, an, ad, an admin will need to do that. But what it allows you to do when it is enabled is in the command bar, you can add this little red um, box where it says visualize this view. So on a view, you can click that and it will automatically generate Power, a Power BI report in a window for you based on the data that is in that view. And that view can then be edited. Um, it'll guess which fields you want to go where, and then if there are fields you want to add, you can click and drag those fields into this Power BI report. Now, a few things to note while this is in preview, the Power BI report that's built is temporary. It's not going to be able to be shared. It's not going to be saved. It just gets created. Uh, and then it lasts for about an hour and then it times out and resets. Uh, so I, they're looking to the future to being able to allow you to share it and, and more functionality like that. But for now, uh, you can just click on it and get a view of what it's going to look like so you can gain some quick insights from the views in your data inside of Power Apps and inside of uh, Dynamics 365 as a whole. Moving on, we've got spark lines are now available inside of tables, uh, table visualizations in Power BI. So you can see here, we've got a spark line gross sales by date. It's just a mini chart that allows you to see trends, uh, large amounts of trends with you know a, a tabular based visualization. Um, this can allow you to highlight maximum values, minimum values, so you can see quickly uh, what the trends are amongst all of this different data instead of trying to spread that on a line chart where it might get messy. Uh, so the way you do this is in a table visualization, you click the drop down on one of your fields, hit add spark line, select the X axis, which is usually a date period and the spark line is added. Next, probably the most exciting update for those of you that use premium is hybrid tables. So Power BI has always had this dichotomy of import mode, which is super high performance, and direct query mode, which has fresh data, but performance usually suffers. And hybrid tables now are able to leverage both of those <coughs> um, storage modes in Power BI, where you can import most of your data, you know, the data, say, from five days ago back from a few years, kind of like incremental refresh, but then you can also direct query the most recent data, maybe the last day of data or the last hour, whatever period you need. And then it's, it organizes it into a couple 
uh, different partitions. That way you can have fresh data and really performant data all in one. And so you set this up very similar to incremental refresh. Then you add a button to add use direct query to query the most recent data. And we can actually see that in a little demo video here. So I've got a SQL query and I run the SQL query adds rows to the table. And in a few seconds, you can see right there, it updated just like that, the visualization. How cool is that? And now you have near real time data in your report. So I ran it again. Now I'm going to delete the rows. You delete the rows and they're gone. The visualization updates instantly. This is huge and will allow you to have really performant and real time data inside of Power BI. Now, just I want to reiterate that this is a premium only feature right now. Um, so for those of you that have premium per user or premium capacity, this is you go try it out. It's super fun. Um, and just that that kind of concludes the the big level updates. I just want to remind you that we do offer Power BI classes in order to dive in more into the fundamentals, into DAX, visualization, modeling, anything you might need. We offer that. And also we have Power Apps courses as well. So please give us a call. Let us know if you need to look into that and want more. Cloud and Office. All right, everybody, let's jump into M365 and all those good, the goodness that is there. Uh, the first update we've got for you is probably been on repeat for us for a while because it will affect pretty much everybody. And that is that licensed services are moving to the new commerce experience. Uh, and that is going to affect anybody signing up after March 1. And if you come up for renewal, that's obviously going to come into play. So basically, you can still do month to month. It's just going to cost you a little bit more, or you can move to an annual subscription to save some money. It's a lot like Netflix in that way. So buy the DVDs or, or subscribe, right? So with that, um, our account managers would love to talk with you about that if you've got questions or not exactly sure how that is going to affect you going forward. Um, cloud site list management, it's a, it's a little thing that not everybody has to deal with, but we have uh, some applications and things that require old Internet Explorer capabilities. And so we have IE mode in Microsoft Edge. And now what they have is IE going away completely as of June 15 of this year. And they now have the ability for you to manage list sites uh, or store site lists, sorry, in the cloud. Uh, and you can even use GPO to push those out to your users. I believe you can even target those by groups uh, and individuals with the pot with the group policy feature. Um, named entities moving over to DLP and sensitive information types. There are 52 new ones that they pushed out there, uh, along with two, uh, uh, 10 new, sorry, data loss prevention policies. Um, DLP is one of my nice little secrets I love to tell folks. You can actually turn DLP policies on, but not have them implement any actions and therefore use them as kind of a monitoring tool up front until you're ready to actually implement. So this gives you a ton more features on being able to, uh, to manage that and control those as you go through uh, your DLP deployments. Um, priority accounts are, are out now. I think they have two things they've put out here. One of them is a uh, mail flow and the other is uh, a security piece. So you can tag uh, high level or important accounts in your environment. Typically this would be your C staff and those types of folks and Defender can put some priority on monitoring those. You can put some priority alerts and things to let you know when maybe mail flow is not moving as smoothly as it should or when there are potential security risks. Very cool feature coming up and they are going to provide even more features going forward. They've just released those first two. Something to keep on your radar. Let's talk about Azure AD updates. The Azure AD graph is going away. Graph is not going away. Azure AD graph is going away and moving under Microsoft graph as of June 30th, 2022. All functionality and all support will be ending for Azure AD graph. The Azure AD graph will actually stop responding uh, to, to your requests, either through code, through whatever you're using. I use it a lot with PowerShell. So uh, that's going away. You've got to convert over to Microsoft graph. There's a bunch of mapping. Uh, Mappings out there on the internet. If you want to go search that and find those, uh, Microsoft has documented those quite well. Uh, number matching and MFA notifications. For those that do password lists, you'll usually get the little number or it's uh, one number that's sent to you, and then you have three numbers that would pop up on your authenticator. Now, what they've changed it to is giving you the ability to uh, push this out where you actually make the user type in that number, that two digit uh, number, so that's a little bit more secure, where it actually requires a little bit more effort on the user's part to make sure that they are who they say they are. 
this is deployable to uh, by groups, either dynamic or static, and you can so you can push this out in kind of a phased approach if you want to try it or give it a, a trial run and a pilot in your environment. Another update for uh, AD uh, Azure AD is that ADF users could be receiving more login prompts. This went in, I think, in December, uh, into towards the end of December last year, and so the ability for uh, Azure AD to push more prompts to the user for ADFS because it doesn't silently log them in anymore, or it has the potential to if your ADFS supports that. So uh, what happens is the users in the past have been typically logging in with ADFS stuff, and because they're already logged in with an account, it pushes them right in and silently, quote unquote, logs them in. When that may not be the account they need to log into or want to log in with. So now what will happen is if ADFS and everything is set up to support this based on your version and those types of things, uh, a Azure AD when hit with a a uh, a hint can be can can force the user to enter a new login uh, account or continue with their existing account. So just something to be aware of. And if you're still on ADFS, we probably all need to talk. So give us a call on that one. Uh, conditional access update. Um, I deal a lot with CA policies. We actually had some some unique things going on with those recently and. Uh, we would love to talk with you guys about conditional access. It's a very powerful tool, but it is a very finicky tool as a result, and you need to know uh, kind of what you're doing and you don't kill yourself with different policies that are conflicting. To that point, uh, Microsoft has reconfigured the way the client apps condition works inside of conditional access. Typically, you can leave this unselected and it didn't really care about any of these things, but with the, with the onset of legacy authentication, ding, 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 another update that we've probably said before, but don't have in here today, that is ending legacy authentication support is ending at the end of this year. They have set this up to where if you don't configure this uh, legacy authentication authentication clients will actually be included now in all of these things and it's going to be very difficult to tell the difference. So you need to be specific when you're setting up your client apps condition inside of CA policy. There's plenty of things out there on the Internet, but we would love to talk with you and kind of go over your CA policies if you have time, because that's a very important part of your tenant management. Cross tenant access is a new feature that's out. I uh, don't know that it's a GA yet, uh, and I probably have it on my notes, but I don't have them up on the side, so sorry about that. But this will allow collaboration with members across other tenants, which we already can do, but this will allow you to control more of that, and you can target it down to a user or I believe even a group and different things like that, uh, the company itself, to where you can actually determine if you're going to trust that company, those the, the, the claim from that company, trust their MFA scenario from their tenant, so it gives you a lot more granularity in allowing uh, guests to access your tenant from other Microsoft tenants. Very, very cool uh, feature set there that they're going to be building out. E exchange online updates. I want to pause here for a second and stay on this slide, but basic authentication is going away in Exchange Online. This is huge. The data is very small in here, but it should be massively bigger. October 1, 2022. Basic authentication for legacy protocols will be disabled. That includes things beyond just your standard POP and IMAP and SMTP that we talk about all the time. Uh, it actually has a, um, effect on things like remote PowerShell for Exchange. It has effect um, on, a, on uh, what's the other one? Oh, SMTP auth. If you're using SMTP auth, it will remain on. Microsoft is going to detect that and not turn off SMTP auth when this happens. However, if you are not using SMTP auth or you're in the middle of a migration and you're setting up a new tenant, for example, uh, you want to make sure that you are not using any of these legacy authentication protocols and preferably not using SMTP authentication because there is a point in the future where that will absolutely be turned off as well. But this has the potential to affect not just your users and their ability to get the email, but this has the ability to, to affect things like printers that send email and use SMTP auth and or other legacy authentication methods to to connect to your system and send those. So uh, we we probably need to talk. If you have a ton of printers that are getting a little long in the tooth, you're probably going to have issues towards the end of this year if you don't do some upgrades there and consider how you would handle this. So we would love to talk with you about how to fix that uh, before well before October 1st, because you'll be behind the behind the ball if you if you wait till then. Um, the classic EAC deprecation exchange uh, admin center is pretty much gone. It is there are little things that are moving around here and there and you can still go back and forth I think until September. But if you're not using the modern one, the new uh, Exchange Admin Center, you need to go ahead and switch that over to your tenant and start getting used to where those things are. I know for me it's a pain because I, I memorized where everything was in the old one and now I've got to learn where all the new things are. So anyway, worth getting started on now because uh, it's just going to force you to do it in September. 
Um, transport rule report, uh, again, Microsoft Exchange Admin Center likes to move. They've been moving things around different places. This was in Security Compliance Center. It's now moving back over to Exchange uh, Admin Center, the modern one, the new one. So uh, it'll let you report on your mail flow. It gives a nice little report to make sure you're uh, you're getting your mails through for everybody. Intune updates. It uh, going forward as of January 7, 2022, um, it only supports Android 8.0 and up. So if you've got mobile devices, BYOD or corporate, uh, and they're older than 8.0, you need to upgrade them or something because they're not going to be working. Um, remote help is a really cool new piece in the admin center. I believe it's currently in preview. Um, and it is currently free in preview, but it will have a cost when it goes GA, just so you know. But this, uh, think, think to use a to use a brand name, think Team Viewer integration with your end users through endpoint management, where you can fire up a remote session with the user and help them directly on their device, and it's built into endpoint management. Very, very slick, very cool, and obviously uh, very helpful. But as I mentioned, free right now. When it goes GA, there will be a price or licensing scenario with this. Uh, but but really cool that it's built in, doesn't require you to go anywhere else to get another tool or, or deploy another tool set. Um, got a lot of easier troubleshooting on errors inside of endpoint management as well. They've got some uh, uh, policy. When you have a policy that's in conflict, you're going to have the ability to click on a, uh, a link right inside of uh, your management tool set there in the admin center and go straight to reports that will let you know if there are assignment failures and other different things that go on with your devices. So a lot of improvements coming there. We're also seeing a really big uptick and a lot of folks trying to get their devices under control, specifically with endpoint management and Intune features. So if you guys have been thinking about that, get on the list now because it's just getting longer and we're getting a lot of backup with folks wanting to get that done, but uh, just finding the time to be able to get through everybody that wants this done. So get get on the phone with quickly and let's sign that up. I'm going to hand it over to Dynamics. Take it away. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, going to give a couple quick updates on uh, Business Central. Um, they're going to be releasing their uh, 2022 Wave 1 uh, here in April. Uh, some of the key operational updates, uh, we Shopify and Microsoft uh, have agreed on a partnership. So we will have a Shopify connector that is going to come you know, basically default in the system. Um, there was some third-party extensions that used to do this. Uh, now it's just going to be a, a, a core application inside Microsoft. Uh, they also added some enhancements to the jobs module, um, some different flexibility where you can have the sell to and build to be different. Um, also now supports uh, warehouse operations. So if you're doing any type of warehouse picks, uh, direct and putaways, anything along those lines, um, you can now integrate those and use that functionality with jobs. Uh, some other key fields and functionality that was added um, on our payment journals. Uh, they did add some debit and credit totals when you're importing the data that can be very valuable for a check figure um, as you're importing that data. They also added a preview posting. Um, this was one of the screens that was missing that preview posting. So that's a big win that they've got that added in there now. Uh, bank reconciliations. This one's a huge one. Um, there was kind of a shortfall up to this point that you could not get a reconciliation report after it had been posted. Um, we had been instructing all our clients to just print that, uh, but now Microsoft has added the functionality that you can go pull a posted reconciliation report. It's going to give you outstanding checks, any outstanding deposits, um, you know, the typical data that you would find on a reconciliation report. Uh, some functionality around deferrals. Um, you can now control your posting dates for deferrals specifically outside of just your normal posting dates. So this is beneficial. Um, now you don't have to open up a, a whole year um, for the whole system. You could just open up the year for deferrals. Uh, another cool feature that they added is the flexibility of changing a posting group on a customer or vendor. Um, this is a one-to-one a -one relationship, and so if you did need to kind of create a, a miscellaneous transaction with this, this was a little difficult to do prior to this, um, but now you're going to have that flexibility on a specific document. Um, also added some, some capabilities of combining across a customer and a vendor. So if you've got a vendor that's also a customer, you can now view those balances as a consolidation. Okay, um, some of the stuff on the administration side. Um, 
anytime new users are being added to the system, um, it used to just default that it gives them full access. Um, obviously, if, if we don't adjust that, that could cause some problems. So now what we're going to do is when we add new users, we'll actually assign what permissions that should be given to those users before they're even brought into the system. So this will help control security a little bit. And one big update that I really like on permissions is up to this point, uh, Microsoft basically had it set up where you go through and flag what you can do inside the system. They are now adding the functionality where you can just remove a certain function from a permission set. So I've run across a lot of scenarios where it may be easier just to exclude something rather than having to go and try to include everything they need. So that's a big win there. Also some reporting updates. They added some functionality that you can actually kick your uh, report layout out into Excel and use everything in Excel as far as a formatting tool for the report. So sliders, diagrams, charts, pivot tables, you know, you've got access to that whole suite of Excel functionality. So those are kind of the major updates as far as BC. Um, I do wanna just quickly touch base on a couple of the Journey Team products that are specific to Business Central. Uh, we do have our Sherpa program. I've uh, been doing that for about a year now and very successful. Uh, Self-guided implementation where, you know, you guys, the client would do a bulk of the heavy lifting and we would be there to support you. Uh, our next Sherpa kickoff program is on April 12th. So if you're interested in that, just let us know. Uh, we've also designed a Power BI template app. And essentially this is a financial dashboard that we have built that you can just connect directly to your BC database and you will get a, a, a very good financial uh, dashboard. Uh, we reached out to quite a few clients to get some feedback on, on what important charts and visualizations they would like to see. Um, we're always open to feedback. So if you are interested in that, um, definitely let us know on that one as well. And then the final one I wanted to talk about is our page extender application. Um, any of the Business Central users uh, are aware that, you know, sometimes certain fields are accessible and sometimes certain fields are not. Uh, what we did is basically went in on the back end and developed an app that would open up all the fields that are available to all of your pages. So if you're running into situations where you're wanting certain fields added to different pages, this page extender app would help. Okay, that's it from a BC standpoint. Okay. Um, all right, kind of circle back into some Dynamics 365 customer engagement. Um, so there's a couple big things that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of them is Teams integration. So this has been something that everyone's been clamoring for for quite some time. And it's not so much just the Teams collaboration, which has been out for a while, where you can link a Teams channel to a specific uh, record instead of Dynamics. It's a lot more powerful than that. Um, you can actually have Teams chat pop-ups directly within Dynamics, and then you can also link conversations to Dynamics, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And then the next portion is related to Power Apps. So we are seeing an increasing um, number of use cases for leveraging Canvas apps and custom pages within Dynamics, as these are all kind of part of um, they're replacing a lot of web parts, web parts and custom JavaScript that we used to, to do a lot more frequently because a lot of them can be done directly with a Canvas app or a custom page. The limitation, however, is that um, as the Canvas apps became more complex, um, you can only have one person doing the editing in that Canvas app at a time. So there is some co-authoring um, features that are rolling out as well as being able to put your Canvas apps in version control, which is also really big. Um, so I will go to dive into a little bit further into the Teams collaboration. So this is what it's going to look. And what I'll say is that um, the preview is in March of this year. Um, so I think that everyone should be kind of preparing for this, but this is kind of what the representation inside of Dynamics will look like with Teams integration. So as you can see that on this account, you can have a Teams flyout where you can link specific channels and or see recommended channels, um, conversations, channels uh, within Teams and have those be recommended to you so that you can link them to the specific account. So if you are working collaboratively 
on a specific, uh, let's say, account, lead, opportunity, case, um, it also marketing email. Um, you can have specific conversations directly associated to those records tied to um, your Dynamics 365 record. So it just makes it to where everything is kind of connected together. You are able to go pick up conversations where you left off. You're able to onboard additional people into those conversations and, and um, get them caught up to speed more quickly. And it's not just a one-to-one. -one. You can have a series of chats and conversations about a specific account, a lead, an opportunity, and have those all tied to that record. So it is, it is a one-to-many. And then the other big feature is that this isn't just so much linking chats, channels, et cetera, to Dynamics 65 accounts or records, but you can also directly from Dynamics have Teams chat pop-ups to where I can, I can click that link channel, I can get my chat pop-up, um, kind of similar to what Yammer looks like when you're, when you're inside of it. Um, and then you can have it, continue that conversation about this record for those collaboration needs. So this has been something that people have been clamoring for for quite some time. Um, and it is, I'm, I'm happy to say that we are, um, we're getting there. It's, it's, it's in preview in March. Um, and I think that it's, it's something that can be leveraged across almost all customers and clients. And there's a use case for it uh, across the board. A couple other little tidbits is that it will, um, it's available for the sales, customer service, and marketing modules currently. Um, so if you have licenses and you are leveraging these modules, the record types with that you can find within them, kind of like I mentioned, it could be marketing emails, um, it, you know, anything in sales, you, you get your accounts, contacts, leads, opportunities, and cases kind of being some of the big ones. Um, so these can all be enabled for the team's collaboration. And here's just a, a screenshot kind of showcasing the um, kind of what it looks like from, from both directions. The, the other part of the team's collaboration is that what we're finding with customers and engagements is that everything's connected and some people prefer to engage with their um, software systems in one location as opposed to the other. So let's say some people don't mind or they like being inside of Dynamics directly from the web browser. Some customers, hey, I just want to uh, I just want to interact with my Dynamics records from within Teams. And you can do both and it's the same experience and you can kind of connect those together. So it kind of just another way to um, kind of connect your users with the information that they need in the manner in which they want to interact with their data. So a good example of this, just as, as far as a use case would be um, customers that are looking for, you know, internal IT support where um, internal users are pinging them as far as, you know, support that, they, that they're interested in or, you know, bugs or problems that they're having. And it could be tied to a specific, you know, IT support channel that the whole organization has access to. That channel could have a Power Automate flow tied to it, which is creating cases. And you could have a different tab within that within that same channel that opens up Dynamics, and you can kind of see uh, recent or open cases, so on and so forth. Um, so just kind of an interesting use case that seems to be um, popping up, but that's kind of a way that we can kind of interact with this is that users that are living in Teams, using Teams as a canvas can still use Teams as a canvas and interact with all the data and have it be integrated across the board. All right, so Canvas app co-authoring. So kind of the big, you know, kind of like what, what I talked about a little bit earlier is that Canvas apps are becoming increasingly more uh, prevalent within our customers. Um, as far as the different ways that they're using them, um, kind of, you know, you, simplifying experiences, having a, you know, maybe a mobile Canvas app, um, you know, across the board. And probably the, one of the big things that's kind of been um, a pain point that we have seen is that the inability to co-author a Canvas app. Um, so that is coming. So I think that this is going to be big. You know, you will no longer see that you are locked out. Or if you use, you know, multiple browser profiles or multiple machines um, and you are getting locked out of your own Canvas app that you are editing. 
So I think this is going to be a big one. And then kind of talking a little bit more about the version control is that it's nice to have that security for Canvas apps to be in version control. So if if something goes wrong, Canvas apps are getting more complex, you are able to revert that more easily than you have been in the past. Because in the past, it would just be a matter of you take one of your old Canvas app solutions that you imported previously that was functioning, and then you can kind of re-import that. But now you can restore um, your Canvas app and then um, get, you know get, get yourself back to a functioning state if in case you made some changes that, that um, broke functionality. There are a couple things to talk about with the with the Git version control is that there's no options to merge or, or excuse me, resolve merge conflicts within make.powerups.com. So it will do an auto merge. And if there are if there's more control that you need in that merge process, you can go directly to your source control and then you can kind of resolve those conflicts there. Um, the other good call out here is that this fe this feature as far as the Git version control does is not compatible with code components yet. So I didn't see that listed in the timeline, but they specifically called out that, you know, if you have code components within your can within your Canvas app, that that is not going to be supported in Git version control. Um, I hope that this comes soon because that would probably be the number one thing that you would actually want in your Git version control. But um, that's that's kind of the update for Microsoft. So I'm expecting that we'll have some more direction there as far as the code components. Next up, marketing. Um, Microsoft is continuing to invest in Dynamics marketing and continue to roll out features um, that kind of build out its feature set and options that can be leveraged for marketing professionals. So one big one is that you can now configure marketing up with your SMS um, provider, you know, example like Twilio. So you, that can be configured configured in Azure. You can set up a customer journey. So whatever the trigger point is, you can have it toward your customer journey. One of the outputs is that it is sending a text message, test text message to your segment and or marketing list customers. Um, so the idea here is that you can send that text message and now from within the customer journey, you can do keywords. So if somebody replies a specific phrase, to your message, you can perform a different action or sub action, kind of whatever you'd like to do. Um, so it's good to see that this feature is included. This is kind of how most things work nowadays, right? If you want to, you know, stop receiving updates, you can you can text back stop or no. Um, and now you can kind of um, feed different conversation elements to your customers that you are texting related to this customer journey. So I think that there's a lot of really cool use cases here from a transactional standpoint and to just a uh, marketing standpoint as well. All right. And then the as far as uh, just kind of doing a lay of the land here as far as different Dynamics 365 applications, we have, um, you know, because obviously we tend to use a lot of terms here, but customer engagement generally refers to sales, marketing, field service, customer service, and project operations. Um, Dynamics 365, we have customer voice, customer insights, sales insights, and customer service insights. Um, probably another thing that's good to know, it's not so much that came out this wave, but Customer Service Insights is now included with the Customer Service Enterprise License. Um, so that's no longer a separate license that's included in that specific license. So you can kind of get some additional um, Power BI reports, dashboards, and AI, and that just comes with it. And then next up, Power Apps. So Power Apps includes model driven apps, Canvas apps, and Power Apps portals. All right, so uh, I want to wrap up. I want to just mention a couple of upcoming events that we have going on. Um, we have a Power Apps webinar that's happening on March 15th. Um, if you have not received an invite, let us know. We'll be happy to, to get you included in that. We also talked about a few of our Sherpa programs that are coming up. And again, just a reminder what a Sherpa program is, is it's a structured self-guided implementation. So we have Business Central and we also have one for Power Apps, um, both where you guys can get up fast um, where you have the capabilities of, of kind of going um, being able to do them on your do them yourself with with us giving you the the right guidance direction and and support on that 
Um, the next Tech Insider update, um, mark your calendars, will be May 17th. Um, this will be the, the last one. Well, this will be the one for, uh, for a quarter two. And then also, um, just a couple of, uh, another thing to talk about. Um, for those of you who are looking for and really want to understand your business processes better, seeing how you can mature and improve your business processes. We have a maturity model assessment that we put out um, that we do to help an analyze the whether it's in sales, marketing, field service, customer service, et cetera. Really look at what you're doing and, and how we can improve those processes. And we put you on a scale from one to five, um, five being optimized, one being initial, right? Um, and we can help you kind of look at how you can advance your business forward in those in those areas. That's something that would make a lot of sense for you guys. Um, please fill it out on the form and uh, on the survey and, and let us know. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up.